Yeah, he just looked at me like, yeah, all right, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll get to that. All right. Let's do remember a couple of prayer requests. Let's do remember Brother Wink uh, and your prayers. I have not talked to them. I've tried to get a hold of her Friday several times, and I, I wasn't able to get a hold of them. Um, so let's do remember them in our prayers. Uh, we'll check on them this afternoon and see if we can get a hold of them. Uh, but do remember them. Continue to pray for Miss Brenda. She is looking at having surgery again. Uh, they're waiting on an MRI. I'm not sure if they've got it scheduled yet to find out exactly where the fracture is, but they're saying that she does have another fractured vertebra. So you pray for her as she gets all that together. Pray for Brother Bruce and Miss Opal. Uh, they are still uh, uh, sick. Uh, as of yesterday, or as of Friday, they were both still running fever. Uh, so let's do remember them. It's been uh, almost a week and a half, pushing two weeks, uh, that they've had COVID. So just do remember them uh, in your prayers that they would uh, begin to recover and get over all of that. So uh, I know they would appreciate your prayers there as well. Uh, so the continue, um, I know Gavin's got appointments coming up and Miss Barbara Crouch has appointments coming up and uh, just several different things we, we know that are going on that we want to remember. So <clears throat> let's continue uh, to pray for all of these. I want to encourage you. Uh, if you have not, it's not too late. You're not, you, you, it's, not worried. it's not to the point now where you just want to give up, all right? Uh, if you have not started your Bible reading program or schedule yet, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, we have some Bible reading schedules you can pick up back there uh, on the table in the foyer. Uh, also, if you need a schedule as far as you would like to read chronologically or, or different uh, ideas, you'll talk with me. I can give you some ideas of where to look, and I've got some that I can, that I can give you uh, just reading through the, through the Bible. They have all kind of different plans that you can pick up. I, I, see, I saw one the other day. Uh, where you can read through the entire Bible in, in six months. Uh, it's, it's got it written out for you. If you'll follow these there, uh, treatments, antibiotics, all kind of different things. Uh, I would like to, to, I'm going to mention that this morning to the church about the possibility of uh, helping out with the hospital bills. As of right now, I uh, messaged him this morning and was, talk, was, was messaging with him. As of right now, their, their hospital bill uh, is $900. Uh, now, that doesn't count the medications and things that he'll be on for the next uh, four months. Uh, but we'll, we'll kick around the idea of the possibility of uh, helping out there. I'm sure there'll be other churches. I'm not asking the church to do all of it, uh, but I'm sure there are other churches that be involved. But in looking at the funds in the mission account, uh, it would be nice for us to be able to uh, help in that need. Uh, so we'll be talking about that after uh, service this morning, I mean, I just want to encourage you to be praying about that, be thinking about that as well. Pray for him. Pray for Gabriel is his name. Uh, he is four months old, if I, if I got that correct, uh, somewhere between four and six. I, uh, but really, really struggling with asthma. Uh, so pray for, for that family. Uh, missionaries, they're Filipino nationals, but they're, they're missionaries in Cambodia. Uh, so do, do remember them. All right, we're going to pray. <clears throat> And then we're going to jump right in uh, to our, our lessons uh, today. Father, again, we're thankful for the day. What a joy it is just to be in your house. I pray that you'll help us tonight, uh, this morning uh, just to continue to keep our eyes focused on you. Uh, give us wisdom. Uh, help us as we look into uh, the revelation. We're getting into the, the final stages, the final steps, of the last couple of chapters. I pray that you'll give us wisdom. Help us as, as we uh, study I pray that you'll be with each one of these prayer requests, specifically uh, with Brother Wink. I pray that you'll just have your hand on him and the family. Uh, be also with uh, Gabriel, um, that you'll just continue to be with that family there serving in Cambodia. I pray that you'll be with others of our family that are going to be uh, going through different procedures uh, in the near future. I pray that you'll have your hand on each one of them and give grace and strength. Father, help us today as we search the Scriptures. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Again, Revelation chapter number 21. We've made it all the way through to the 21st chapter. Uh, amen. That's, a, uh, that, that's a, a feat all by itself. Brother, Brother Tony, would you mind turning the heat down? Amen. I did too until just now. All right. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and jump in. We're, we, we have made it into 
the heavenly ages. We've, we've gone all the way through the Revelation. We've hit we didn't we didn't hit every verse and, and you know do a, a deep dive into all of it. But we've kind of gone through all the basic uh, details and ideas. We've, we've gone through the tribulation. Uh, we've met, gone through the millennial reign of Christ and kind of gave you some thoughts on that. Uh, so we're going to get into the heavenly ages, and, and it's interesting. While we we looked at the millennial reign of Christ and we we didn't see a whole lot in the Revelation. We had to go to other passages of Scripture to help fill in some of the, the I hate to say gaps, but fill in some of the other information uh, about the millennial reign of Christ. The difficulty going forward is there's really nowhere else to go to find information about what we're dealing with now. What we're going to find in the Revelation really is basically all of the information that we're going to receive about these, these subjects. Uh, so... While we are given some detail, uh, we're not given a tremendous amount. We, you know, we're in 21, and obviously there's only chapter 21 and 22, and we're done. Uh, and, half a, and over half of chapter 22 is kind of the closing uh, of the book of the Revelation. So about a chapter and a half uh, is all we've got left as far as information about these, the heavenly ages. I, I think for one reason there's not a whole lot of information given about the heavenly ages is because we couldn't understand it anyway. Uh, there's just so much going on over there uh, that trying to take spiritual uh, ideas or spiritual things and couching them in terms that we understand is a difficult thing. Uh, that Jesus many times in, in his mini earthly ministry would use parables and illustrations and, and try to, to, to talk in terms that we could understand trying to explain something that really there were no terms or no words to express uh, to us uh, the, uh, of, the, of the reality of what he was discussing. And we'll see that uh, in this. Now, with that thought, let me just say this and we'll, we'll jump in. By no means am I trying to say that everything that we're going to read uh, in 21 and 22 should be specifically or simply spiritualized uh, and just say, well, this just pictures something we couldn't. I'm not saying that, all right? Uh, you, you understand that I do take the Bible literally, and I believe, we'll, you'll get, we'll get to this, but I believe when the Bible said that each gate was a, of a several pearl, I believe that each gate was made of one pearl. I, I believe the Bible and I believe the Scripture. So um, uh, what's, the, what's the, 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 the old saying? You know, we've, we've said it over and over and over again. If the plain sense uh, makes common sense, seek no other sense, lest it all become nonsense. Amen. So we'll stick with the Scriptures. All right. So we're going to jump right in. Revelation uh, 21. There, there are seven things as you go through uh, from here forward there, where we're going to class them into seven different ideas uh, of things that begin to change tremendously from the millennial reign of Christ into the heavenly ages. All right. So we've, we've got to get to the place to where we stop thinking within our box. And we start th stop thinking within our limited, restricted understanding. And we start thinking beyond that and, and realize that we're moving into an area uh, that, that God is, is, is just taking us to places we've never dreamed. All right, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. The seven places, number one, uh, the, the heavens are, are just going to be completely changed. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, number two, uh, we'll talk about this one. The earth is going to be completely different. Uh, it'll be, we've, already, we've already talked about that in, in Revelation chapter 20, how uh, at the great white throne judgment, the Bible said that, that heaven and earth fled away and there was no more space found for them. All right. Now, there are some that believe right there, and I, I guess I'll throw this in right here. Uh, there are some that believe when it talks about the heaven and the earth fled away, they're, 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 they're talking about the, the, the ball, the, the actual terra firma, if you will, uh, and then the... the, the atmosphere around the earth. I'm, I'm a little beyond that. I think that everything that we understand today, heaven, earth, space, anything that has been, and I'll use this phrase carefully, touched by man. I don't mean physically touched, but you, but you understand what I mean by that, um, is, is gone, is disappeared. You know, I don't, I don't think we're going to enter the heavenly ages and out there somewhere Pluto is going to be flying around in space somewhere. Uh, no, I think God just did away with all of that. When he said heaven and earth passed away, I believe that's exactly what he meant, that, that everything was gone that we understand. Well, where did they stand? Wherever God wanted them to stand. 
All right? Uh, so we'll, we'll get into that as we go through. All right? Uh, the next one is this. We will, there'll be a new Jerusalem. Boy, that'll be fun. Uh, we, we won't get to that today, but we'll, we'll see that. And I like this. He says this, that all things, we will talk about this today, all things will be made new. Mm, I like that. We're going to have a glorified body. We won't have to deal with all of this stuff that we're dealing with now. Uh, we, we're not going to have to deal with all the... Uh, I'll get into that. I'll, I'll, I'll teach the whole lesson right there. Uh, paradise. Parad- our understanding of what paradise is going to be is going to be so changed. We think about... What do you... Don't answer out loud, okay? What do you think about when you think of paradise? You know, some folks think of different things. Some, some folks you think paradise. Some folks think of sandy beach, toes in the sand, wind in your hair. You, you know, uh, some folks you think of paradise. You think of 100 acres out in the middle of the woods, you know, with one acre cleared out right in the middle with an old cabin on it, you know. Uh, now we're talking paradise, amen. Uh, you know, uh, some folks paradise, all your family gathered around, wherever that might be. You know, it's all different to everybody. God's going to change all that. He's, he's going to demonstrate. He's going to show us what paradise really is, all right? We're going to see this, uh, our concept, and and here's where I'm kind of trying to to, to bait or or, or wet the hook, if you will. Uh, uh, Our concepts of of everything is going to change. Uh, Light itself. You know, right now we are dependent as as earthlings. Be careful. We, We are dependent on that ball burning in the sky. That sun disappeared today, it wouldn't take long to where this earth would no longer exist as we understand it. All right? Uh, and we're dependent upon that. It, and, you know, that sun sets in the evening, it goes dark. We're dependent upon that. There's going to come a time where that's not going to be the case. And our concepts, everything we understand is going to change. All the laws, I'll pause and say this right here. All the laws that, we, that, that dominate our thinking, all the laws of gravity, all the laws of sight and sound, all the laws of feel and touch and taste, and all of that is going to change. It's going to be different. What are we going to... Well, that's, that's, that's a lot of speculation. You start thinking about what sounds are we going to be able to hear? What things are we going to be able to see when our body functions perfectly, glorified, and functions perfectly to its fullest extent as God created it? Hmm. Amen. The throne of God is going to change. Hmm. We'll, we'll get to these as we go through. All right. So we're going to jump in and start with this idea. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. Now, I purposely didn't read because we're going to read each one of these verses. We're going to cover the first eight verses this morning, and we'll read each one of those as we go through. Revelation 21, verse number 1, look at this. John said this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So the first thing that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 21 uh, is that there is a new heaven and a new earth. Well, what, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> okay, I, again, I've already stolen my own thunder on this one. I, I believe when it says there is a new heaven and a new earth, that's exactly what it means. Well, there are some that will say, well, no, God's just going to remove anything on the earth that was touched by man, and He's just going to take this ball, and He's going to rework it. And What's the Bible say? New heaven and a new earth. And then it kind of doubles down on that, if you will. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Remember Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11? Remember what it said? I'll read it to you. And I saw a great white throne, and the him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. All right? Uh, So we understand that in this final judgment, heaven and earth has passed away, it's gone, uh, and God's going to begin to rebuild or rework or or give us a new heaven and a new earth. What's it going to be like? We're not real sure. 
How big is it going to be? We don't really know. Where is it going to be located? Wherever God wants to put it. We're not given that information. All we're given about this new heaven and this new earth is God is going to make it and God is going to give it to us. And then there's a thought, and I'll just, we don't have time for, to, to chase this rabbit a long way. Uh, but notice what he said, and it's, it's interesting to me that, that God, in His inspiration, allows John to write this next phrase in verse 1. What's the next phrase? And there was no more sea. I think that tells us a couple of things. Number one, it tells us that it's going to be completely different than anything we've ever understood. Most of our earth is covered by water. I forget the 74, 78%, I forget. Most of it is covered by water. It's not usable for man to inhabit. And then, and then you start talking about the mountains and all these other uninhabitable places. I forget the exact percentage, but we're already down to 25% of the earth is actually inhabitable. Well, God's again telling us it's not going to be anything like it used to. But I think there's something else that, that just jumps out to me. My, my wife's heard me preach, preach this uh, many times, and I'll probably do it again before it's all said and done. Uh, but John looks out across as this picture uh, that you're looking, or that picture, I'm looking at the one back there. This picture you're looking at actually uh, is taken from the Isle of Patmos, and it's looking out to sea from the Isle of Patmos. Don't forget, as John's writing this and John's giving this, John's sitting on this island. And John has a heart and he has a desire to be with the people of God on the mainland. And he wants to be there so bad. And he wants to pastor them and help them and love them. And he, gets, he finally gets to go back. But, but as he's writing this, he's sitting there. And the one thing that is separating him from those people that he loves is that stinking sea. John looks over into the new heaven and the new earth, and something catches his attention. <laughs> it's almost like I can see that old man get up and start to shout. As he looks over in that new heaven, that new earth, and he says, bless God, there'll be no more sea. There'll be no more separation from those that we love. There'll be no more separation from the God that we understand hung uh, the moon and the stars. There'll be no separation. It's going to be different. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. That's supposed to look like separation sinking into the sea. My wife looked at that like, what in the world? <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Amen. All right. But he said there'd be no more sea. Well, there's some preaching right there. I'm looking forward to being in that place of no separation. The next thing he said in verse number 2, and I, and I John, saw the holy city... New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I'm going to pause right here and remind you of something Jesus said in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. We're not so I'd have told you. I go to prepare place for you we see in verse 2 this place coming down out of heaven prepared now catch this as a bride adorned for her husband everything is perfect everything is in order everything is in place everything hey John looked over there and John said Mm. I don't understand it. I can't explain it all. I can't even write what I'm seeing. But here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm seeing a new city, a new Jerusalem, a new dwelling place. And it's coming down out of heaven. And he's going to give us a lot more d d uh, ex uh, explanation. And we'll do that next week about this new Jerusalem. But just suffice it to say at this point, that it is coming down from heaven, uh, and it is, uh, he does see that, and he will discuss that here in a little bit. 
All right? As we go on, look at verse number 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse number 3 is very interesting as we begin to understand. Again, we're trying to make the, the transition from our understanding and our thinking to God's. We're really beginning to see a little bit of the mind of God that just is so greater than ours. He says in verse number 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now, when we, when we hear that phrase, from a, a human perspective, Number one, the, probably the first thing we think of when we see here the tabernacle of God is we think about that old tent in the wilderness. The tabernacle. The place where God met with His people. Oh, there's a meeting place. The tabernacle of God is with men. Now, and, and maybe if we've studied some and we've, we've, we've been in the Scriptures like we have, uh, we can make that connection and we can go beyond that and think, well, you know, uh, in, in Israel, that temple that was built was built to replace that, that tabernacle, that tent, uh, and, and God dwelt there so, so we can go even further into this idea of not just a, a tent in the wilderness, but a tabernacle or, or a temple uh, that was the, the place of, of worship and the place where God met with His people. So not only will it be a, a meeting place or a tabernacle, but, but the temple. But read this verse and look at what it says. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Look at this. And He will dwell with them. He's talking about the tabernacle here. He's not talking about a tent in the wilderness. He's not talking about a building that was arrayed like Solomon's temple. He's not talking about mortar and stone as Herod's temple. And he's not referring to that rebuilt temple that will, that will show up in uh, the tribulation. Or that temple that is built during the millennial reign of Christ. He, no, he's not dealing with all of those. He's, de he's not dealing with the picture. He's dealing with the person. The tabernacle. Dealing with the very throne of God. And God Himself, He finished the verse. He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. We'll get to this as we go through all this, but there's something very interesting that you do not see in Revelation 21. And 22. You never, never again will you see a temple. There's no need for a temple. Why? Because God Himself is there. As we get to verse 4, here's one of the verses that a lot of people look forward to. Right? Verse 4, now we've talked about a new heaven and a new earth. We've talked about new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. We've talked about God Himself being with them. Look at, the, look, look at what happens. Verse 4, and God shall wipe away all, shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, we're, we're moving in, uh, again, we're, we're moving into it. We can't even fathom what this means. You know, why, why, did, God, why did God allow pain and sorrow? Why, why did God allow pain and suffering into this world. Well, first of all, you understand pain is pain is instructional. 
I read this the other day. Well, my wife's going to laugh at me. But I, I read this the other day, and, and I, think it, I, I think it's one of the big problems in our, in our, in our country today. I, I read this. Somebody wrote, stupid ought to hurt. Stupid ought to hurt. Why? Because you learn not to do that again. You know, you ride your bicycle. You fall off your bicycle and hurt yourself. Well, you learn, don't do that again. No, but we, you know, we've gotten to a place to where almost stupidity doesn't hurt anymore. People can just live in stupidity, and it's, you know, and they just kind of go from one to the next. So we look, why did God allow pain? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but God uses a lot of that to teach us and to grow. But you, you understand, we get there. We are completely different. That, that's my whole point today. Just the, the different. We, we can't even grasp. We live with that aspect, or we're, we're trying to potty train a little puppy dog. <laughs> we're struggling trying to train a little puppy dog. She's going to figure it out. She's going to figure out that the, the, the uh, 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 discipline that comes will teach her what she needs to do. All right? We need to understand all of these things have been used for a purpose, but now it's different. Now it's different. Let's talk about these just for a few minutes. Number one, all tears. All tears. That's what he said. He shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And, and I don't know why he starts off with why. I think maybe because that's one of the most important or one of the things that, that really speaks to us. And, and it seems like that he goes on to this verse and he just gives us an understanding of, of what that means. Because he deals with a lot of stuff that will cause or produce tears in our life. But he's trying to get us to understand that, that everything has changed. Our whole focus of existence has changed. Right? He said there'll be no more tears. Why? Number one, there'll be no more death. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more separation. I don't understand this. I, I don't really understand what that means. Our whole society is based on you are born, you live, and you die. Our whole mindset is based on... Why, why do... Ladies, I'll give you a pass right here. Why do most men... Why do most men go through a midlife crisis? Because we realize that our life is short. And we realize there are a lot of things that we wanted to do and planned to do. And life got in the way. And now our life is almost in the twilight years. We haven't done all those Every, the way we think is so governed by that timeline of life. We'll be in heaven and we'll never have to contemplate how many tomorrows there will be because there will not be a tomorrow. We'll not have to worry about getting things accomplished that we want to accomplish before time runs out. There'll not be time. There'll be no more death. No more separation. Back to what John saw in verse 1. There'll be no more sorrow. We could spend a lot of time right here just talking about what brings sorrow into our life. Disappointment. Misunderstanding. There'll not be any of that. It'll be perfect. It'll, here, it'll be paradise too many times again we get so focused and I spoiler alert okay all dogs don't go to heaven sorry and I know we get attached to those little things I understand I do and I'm sorry I've read this Bible once or twice
But here's the thing. We don't think about, we get so wrapped up in our own life, we don't understand, don't think about the reality of what's really taking place there. We think about what's going to soothe our conscience and soothe our understanding and make us feel better. It's not about all of that. It's about Him. And it's about what He's doing. And it's about so much beyond our small understanding of what life really is all about. There'll be no sorrow. This, this is one reason that many people think that, that we'll have no recollection of all the things in the past at this point. We'll not remember the loved ones that did not accept Christ as Savior. We'll not remember the heartache and the, and the sorrow from the past. Because he says at this place there'll be no more sorrow. Sadness. He goes on and says there'll be no more crying. Now there's a difference. What, what's the difference between tears and crying? I, I think in, in this context, I believe that the difference is those tears where he said there'll be no more tears is the result of actual Difficulty. How many of us have raised kids that understand sometimes they can cry to beat 90 and ain't nothing wrong? <laughs> I mean, you just think they's dying. Like, they used to say it this way. You can't say this anymore. People don't understand what you're saying when you do this. They used to say, uh, that you'd lay that young and down that, in that crib and, and they'd go to screaming like that pin was sticking in them. Well, most folks don't understand what that means. You know, back when you had diapers that you had to pin on, you know, sometimes that pin come loose, it could poke the youngin, and you'd run in there and think, oh, man, <laughs> something's wrong. And you grab the child and he shuts up and just smiles real big at you. you all been there. I think tears deals with the idea of, of actual hurt. It says there'll be no more crying, there'll be no more wrong response, there'll be no more pretending, there'll be no more put on, there'll be no more show. All of that drama, that's the word I was looking for, all of that drama. Y'all just smile right there, y'all know some folks like that. Y'all, we got some folks in our family like that. I'm going to stop right there. All right. <laughs> and then he talks about this, there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more pain. Amen. The older I get, the more excited about that I get. Every morning I try to get out of bed. <laughs> it's just kind of, ooh. But aren't you glad the former things are passed away? Now, he, he lists these, these five things. We could spend a lot of time here this morning in developing these ideas and, and just explaining how, again, our whole understanding of everything is just different. We'll finish. We'll give you a couple more, more thoughts. He said this, look at verse number, verse number 6. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, Right, for these words are true and true. You think he's trying to get across the point here that we can't even fathom what it's going to be like? Oh, we can try to get it. We can try to understand a life with no sorrow. We can try to understand the life with no drama. We can try to understand the life with no pain. We can try to understand the life with no death and separation and fear of the future. We can try to understand all of that, but in our little finite mind, we cannot comprehend exactly the relief and release and paradise that we will experience in this place that God has prepared for us. And you hang on to that thought. We're going to try to finish up with that if I remember to get back to it. So in Revelation 21, in verse number 6, look at what it says. And he said unto me. Now, he's fixing to give him a history lesson, if you will. 
He's fixing to say, listen, I've done all of this in preparation. I've got it all pre prepared and ready. We're just waiting for the proper time. Now let's just spend a little time worshiping. Let's just remember what God's done. What's he say here in verse number 6? He said, listen, let's just, let's just worship and let's just lift up the Lord and praise Him. He says, number one, it is done. It is done. What, what do you think went through the mind of John when the one sitting on the throne reminded him it's done? I wonder if my, John's mind began to race. He began to think about all the prophecies that he was taught as a boy, it's all done. I wonder if, he re, if he's reminded of the wise men that came from afar and knelt at the feet of a young child. I, I wonder if he was reminded of a star that stood over a stable. The plan of God, it's done wondered if he was reminded of a cross. And the words, it is finished. I wonder if his mind did not go back to an empty tomb. He is not here. He is risen. But when God said it's done, that encompasses a whole lot, doesn't it? Aren't you glad it's done? Notice the way it's stated. He told John, you write it all down, it is done. All we're waiting for, all we're waiting for is for history to catch up with reality. All we're waiting for is the trumpet to get out of here. All we're waiting for is for God's timing to be fulfilled. It is done. He goes on to remind him. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Told him to write this. Told him, listen, he's revealing to him all of these things. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This has been the plan all along. When Joseph was sold into slavery. God said, that's my plan. My plan. Joseph figured it out many years later and said, you thought it evil unto me, but God meant it unto good. And we could go through and we could go, uh, you know, story after story after story through the scriptures and say, let's show where God worked and God moved, but it's always been the plan of God to bring us through all of this to that place he has prepared. He's the beginning and the end. And then he finishes verse 6. Look at this. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He reminds John that his plan of salvation was the plan from the beginning. It's always been there. It's always been this way. Let's not forget, let's, let's not get so heavenly minded that we're, we're no earthly good. But let's not get so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. Let's remember, God still has a purpose and a plan, and He's doing that and bringing all of this to a conclusion. Then He, then he, then he says in verse number 7 something that just... Look at, and we'll talk about this one. Look at this. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall, and he shall be my son. Now, again, we're going to close this last two verses, but he's going to close with this great contrast, and he's just reminding John, John's still got work to do. John's still got some preach left in him. John's still got some mission work to do. And he's reminding us that until we get to God's time and God's place, uh, until we get there, we've got a job that we need to continue to do. 
John, 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse number 4, it says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So who is this overcomer that he speaks about in verse number 7? He that overcometh. The saved, the born again. Those that believe this, trusted Christ. But he finishes with the contrast. Verse number 8. But, never forget, while we rejoice and revel in what's to come as children of God, never forget. The contrast. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and, and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second. Before we get too excited, before we sit down and wait for our redemption, before we just sit down and just, as the old saying goes, as, as many Baptists do, that we just sit soaking sour. still got a job to do because everyone that does not know Christ as Savior while we look forward to this paradise God has prepared for us those that do not know Christ as Savior do not have that to look forward to and it falls to you and I And it has become our responsibility to share the gospel. As long as there is breath within us, and as long as there is lost folks to win, our responsibility is to share the gospel. I heard a joke statement I hope he was joking I hope he wasn't that theologically off but the comedian that said this that one day when the rapture takes place I'm going to grab a lost person under each arm and as we rise through the heavens I'm going to say are you going to repent or am I going to let go that normally gets a chuckle or two we wait till then, it's too late. Why don't we grab some folks today? Make sure that they know Christ is their Savior today. That when that rapture happens, we won't have to grab them. They'll go with us. I'm looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. I can't wait. I, don't, I can't explain what, a, what it's all going to be like. I don't know what our family situations are going to be. I, don't, I know we're going to be known as we are no, know as we are known. I, I, I understand that. I can't explain how all this is going to work out, but I do know this. It's going to be more than we've ever understood or ever dreamed. But before we lose sight, before we become so, become so focused, and so one single-minded on where we're headed, let's not forget those that do not know Christ. They have a future as well. And it's pretty rough and pretty bleak. And they need Christ. 
will we take the gospel to you? Father, what a joy. Look into Revelation. I, so many things that could have been said, so many things that we could have discussed, but I believe this was exactly what you had for us this morning. But it will help us as we go forward and finish the next few weeks this study through your word. But it will help us this morning as we study together the next hour. Father, meet needs, overcome difficulties. Give grace in Jesus' name.